The Children's Museum of Houston was founded by a group of Houston's parents in 1980 who wanted a significant, centrally located learning resource under one roof, which would model best practices of early childhood development for Houston's families. The founders looked to Reggio Emilia's approach, Maria Montessori, and other thought leaders in human development to establish the tenets that would be required in all of their exhibits and programs. They emphasized whole child development for children birth to 12 years of age and specifically intended to create environments that would encourage open-ended, materials-rich, child-centered learning. They wanted parents to recognize and to provide quality learning opportunities to their children. The museum's mission was to ignite a lifelong passion for learning in all children, and that is our vision today. From the beginning, the Children's Museum of Houston was envisioned as a place where all children and their families would participate together, regardless of ethnicity, religion, or economic circumstances. The museum's leaders saw the changing wave of cultural and socioeconomic diversity that would transform the last decades of Houston's profile in the 20th century, and they celebrated these differences as positives. Some of the museum's founders were ground floor investors in the personal computer revolution that started in the early 1980s. So the museum housed conspicuous science and engineering and obvious mathematics as a way to get young children excited about subjects to which many received no exposure until middle school. The museum had artists engineer interactive exhibits with early computers and engineers create art that children could touch and even climb on. Exhibits introduced communities in Asia, Africa, and Latin America, the countries of origin of our rapidly expanding immigrant population, and a representative cross-section of Houston's child population was elected to serve on the board of directors, comprised entirely of the age range served by the museum. We know adults today who say they chose their careers because of their experiences at our earliest children's museum. Now, over 30 years later, we realize the wisdom of our founders. Today, our attendance is 73% non-Anglo, with 40% Latino families, 26% African American, and the rest are Asian families. Today, neuroscience confirms that during early childhood, the human brain is shaped to support the trajectory of learning throughout life. We know literacy and language skills begin in the moment a child is born, and educators and policymakers now recognize that the investment society makes collectively in early childhood education is insufficient to give the majority of our children the foundation they need for success in school. Decades of studying child care centers point to the quality of parenting as the single most important factor in determining a child's future learning success. No matter the education level, or the socioeconomic level of the parent, the parent is the child's first and most important teacher and must be fully engaged in a meaningful way in a child's life. Perhaps the only thing our founders did not predict was the rapid explosion of our child population. Over the course of the 1990s and the first decade of the 21st century, the population of children in Houston has increased 15% per year. Now more than one and a half million children under 12 live in the Houston area. Children under the age of 12 are more likely than any other age segment to be living at or below poverty in our community. As for the relevance of the museum's original mission of igniting a passion for lifelong learning, the most recent bipartisan Congressional Commission on the American Workforce reports that learner motivation, the determination and understanding to consciously embrace a road to academic achievement, is the greatest difference today from our emerging workforce and that of other countries with whom the U.S. competes globally. The majority of our citizens do not have the learning literacy that Indian and Chinese students do, making it difficult for our citizens to benefit from job retraining to keep their skills marketable. American students do not have a burning desire to achieve what some other country students do. The dogged determination that is necessary to learn marketable skills in English, mathematics, engineering, physical sciences is less evident among our own students than those in other countries. Some believe that India's creation of a well-educated workforce is due to the same impetus that brings families with young children to the Houston area. Just as Indians have been aggressively seeking education as a way to lift their families out of poverty in a class system, so people from around the U.S. and throughout the world see Houston as a place of opportunity. They believe that by working hard here, they can provide the American dream to their children. At the museum, we see parents every day that are highly motivated by the desire to achieve, but lack the understanding of what they must do to effectively encourage achievement in their children. That's what we address at the Children's Museum of Houston.
The current objective of the Children's Museum of Houston is to provide families with young children the tools they need to ensure their children become effective lifelong learners. To do so, we have two challenges. First, we need to reach as many of these families as possible. And second, we need to engage the parents in meaningful interpretation of the information that we are sharing with them as often as possible. Reaching people requires that we offer free admission to anyone that needs to have access to our programs. And it also requires us to deliver our programs at times and in locations throughout Houston that are convenient to families. Therefore, most of the programs take place in the evenings, after work, in underserved neighborhoods. We need to deliver our programs in Spanish as well as English. Our staff must be linguistically and culturally competent to connect with the parents. Our school-based programs involve parents and teachers and children learning together. We go to the school campuses and bring them to the museum as a learning community. And we reach hundreds of after-school locations taking our programs to libraries, faith-based organizations, shelters, YMCAs, United Way agencies, apartment activity centers, and really anywhere there are people caring for children while they are away from their families. The quality of the activities being provided to the children is excellent, meaningful, purposeful, and effective according to the evaluations we conduct. Next, we need to provide the information to the parents in a way that clearly demonstrates their child's unique ability to learn. We rarely just lecture to parents about how to be a parent. Our exhibits and programs are designed to show a parent how to encourage and facilitate learning in their child while their child is present, giving them the overarching child development theory in the process, along with practical applications of how they as parents can facilitate these activities at home, in the grocery store, at the laundromat, on the playground. Over the next several years, we hope to reach more than the 150,000 off-site and the 800,000 we reach on-site each year currently. Our Institute for Family Learning is in the process of redesigning and testing ways in which we can engage parents in multiple session programming to ensure a greater number attend, not just a few sessions or visit the museum occasionally, but that they engage with specific programs over extended periods of time. We also predict that the way we engage with people will be totally changed over the next several years. The digital divide created by access or a lack of access to personal computers in the past decades is ending. By 2020, smartphones will be the worldwide primary access to the web. African Americans are 50% more likely than Anglos to use their smartphones in this way now, and Latino Americans are 40% more likely than Anglos to do so and the overwhelming majority of the parents currently using the museum are asking us to help them understand how to use such universal and expensive technology to teach their children to be active learners. Our staff educators are already pioneering ways that they can use simple tools like QR codes um, and non-proprietary apps to literally illustrate the answers to classic childhood questions, such as how does it work, where does it come from, can I do that, what can it do, etc. Using technology this way will customize learning opportunities in ways that we were never able to do so before. And this will enable us to have more museum educators in contact with the people we serve in meaningful ways. And we hope to have more engineers, more business people, more scientists, more chemists, and more researchers making direct connections to our children and their families in the same ways. The Children's Museum of Houston taps into the desire of most parents to see their children succeed. We make parents aware of what their child can do and should be doing as an active learner. We reinforce to parents how they are the make or break in their child's learning trajectory. And we do this with culturally appropriate, linguistically accessible programs. Twelve programs are delivered at over 100 locations made available through our network of 640 social service partners. And day in and day out, we are an irresistible place that any child and any family can use, at no cost and at their convenience. In Houston, we have many parents who are fully aware of their responsibility as first teachers of their children. As we were conducting focus groups over 14 years ago, one woman told us that she and her husband had left everything behind that they loved in El Salvador to give their children a better future in this country. 
Please tell me what I need to know and give me the tools so I can fulfill these dreams for our children. That mother's determination to see her children be successful is shared today by most of the families drawn to Houston from around the U.S. and the world. Next, we tap into children's natural ability to learn from the moment that they are born. Children are in school settings only 19% of their total waking hours, yet they should be learning constantly. We are building school readiness by providing deeper learning experiences the rest of the time and in a multidisciplinary manner that most naturally occurs in young children. Each week, the museum changes its core programming to a theme of the week. Lab areas around the museum and the activity stations that line the John P. McGovern Hall offer new programs every week. One week, we might be celebrating Pi Day and mathematics. The next week, we might be inventing things using only duct tape. Exhibits have been prototyped and executed to stimulate inquiry-based exploration that leads us to routinely change subject area content around civic engagement, financial literacy, healthy lifestyle choices, math, invention, physical science, process flows, sustainable environmental practices, cultural awareness, and material science. Our Top Spot Gallery offers children from infancy up to 36 months an ideal environment to stimulate physical and cognitive growth. And our education staff delivers running commentary on how infants, crawlers, and toddlers are learning. Online, we are using webcasts to not just teach science content, but to model the behavior that leads to science habits of mind, which can develop cognition skills on many levels. We export these programs to serve over 150,000 children and families annually beyond our doors. The Children's Museum and the outreach programming are accessible to anyone almost 365 days out of the year, no matter their economic status. Our doors are open to any other organization that wants to bring children in their care, so we increase the chances of children and their families having access in any way possible. The Children's Museum of Houston has never seen itself as a museum in the traditional sense. Rather, we are a playground for your mind. We have no permanent collections or precious items, nor exhibits of historical importance. That strategy has helped us keep our overhead low and helped us focus on the needs of the people we serve. We have prioritized building the museum's core competency of delivering customizable learning experiences for those people. Back in the mid-1990s, a major funder approached the museum about giving a gift for a physical expansion because the building seemed too crowded. As a part of our discussion to proceed, we coined the term Relentless Operation Innovation, or ROI. Rather than be distracted by building, we wanted to maximize ROI through three strategies of exhibit programs and service delivery. First, personalize the learning even before affordable personal technology was making mass customization possible. We knew the most effective way for families to learn was within the context of their own personal interest, and that we would have to provide learning environments that were sufficiently dynamic and open-ended for this to occur. Next, exceed expectations. Even if a family is handed a free ticket to attend the museum, they have to find the time and the transportation to get here. All museum attendance, even by teachers seeking professional development, is discretionary. So we have to, day in and day out, exceed expectations of everyone we serve. And third, we design for innovation. It's never been about the static or finding just one way of learning or one way of getting something done. It's about unleashing ideas. Shalaja Nilakatan of one of India's outstanding institutes of technology says it best, Problem solving is the crux of what we do. We teach students to think creatively, independently, aggressively, and provocatively. This thinking is not only encouraged in our visitors, but in our leadership and our staff as well. Those ROI strategies are embedded in every program, exhibit, and all staff training we undertake still today. We use outcome logic models to measure our results, and we routinely adjust our programs and exhibits if we find that the learning outcomes are not reaching our objectives. We used these same processes when we finally did double the size of the museum in 2009 to address the year-round overcrowding. We spent more than four years, in some cases, prototyping ideas for exhibits, using the existing museum as a learning lab, and to test our concepts that the new exhibits could be multimodal, 
multidisciplinary learning platforms that could be rapidly changed to respond to community interest in our own objectives. And part of our ROI is keeping costs down by partnering and collaborating with the best minds with which we can link. No one can do this work alone. To effectively reach the community, we don't need museum satellite locations. Instead, we work at churches, schools, YMCAs, neighborhood libraries, parks, and United Way agencies. We have 640 plus community partners who send us visitors on site and at whose sites we provide programming. And among the Children's Museum of Houston's development partners are the National Science Foundation, the National Institute of Health, numerous universities and colleges, private industry, school districts, and private think tanks. The Children's Museum of Houston establishes measurable outcomes by which the success of each exhibit and each program is judged. Before we launch a project, we make sure that what we hope to accomplish effectively addresses at least one of the community priorities identified by the museum board and advisors as a leading need for families in our area. Those six priority community needs are foster the development of Houston's large child population, enhance parents' involvement in their children's learning, reinforce and supplement classroom instruction, reduce the effects of poverty on learning, serve a multilingual population, and promote workforce preparedness. An example of our work with parents is our FLIP project, Family Literacy Involvement Program. FLIP kits circulate through 35 Houston Public Library branches so parents can use the kits at home with their children, ages birth through eight years old, to make reading the center of family learning. Each of the 2,000 kits includes a book, a Spanish and English activity sheet to guide the parents' facilitation, and every item necessary to do at least one hands-on activity related to the book. Evaluation conducted by the UT Children's Learning Institute shows a 20-point improvement in parents discovering interest and skills of their child when they use a flip kit rather than just reading a book. 94% of all parents tested experienced this result. There was a 53-point gain in parents anticipating changing their home reading practices as a result of using flip kits. 71% of the parents tested had this outcome. And the flip books are flying off the shelves at libraries. We expect at least 20,000 to be read and enjoyed each year, exceeding our goal of 12,000. Parent Stars was begun at the request of our public schools in the mid-1990s to provide parents with strategies to support their children's learning during out-of-school time. Each year, our Parent Stars partner schools customize their programs to best suit their family's needs by selecting from over 20 of our different events. Each Parent Stars event teaches parents about skills and resources they can use at home to support their child's math, reading, and science learning outside of the school day. All of the activities are TEKS aligned and appropriate for a specific grouping of elementary grades. 96% of the parents involved in our Parent Stars workshops plan to use what they have learned to facilitate learning in their homes. 93% indicated that the program made them feel a lot more confident in their abilities as a parent. And 96% reported that their children gained new knowledge as a result of the home-based use of the museum's family learning activity guides. And 73% of teachers with students engaged in Parent Stars programming with their families report that they perform better in school as a result. 15,000 parents are participating on an annual basis. The Museum Science Workshop at Edison Middle School in Houston's 2nd Ward is an example of how the museum's program extends to classroom instruction and also promotes job readiness. This dedicated space combines science lab, wood shop, nature center, and artist studio for students in 3rd through 8th grades. A Harris County Department of Education report found that at 84.8%, the science grade average for science workshop students at Edison was considerably higher than their other subjects, and 98.9% .9 was the attendance rate for those participating in the workshop. On average, the workshop resulted in over 16,000 student hours in project-based science, technology, engineering, and math learning annually. And we've conducted this program for over 10 years. Further supporting classroom instruction and parental involvement is the museum's Family Adventures program. 
The program brings the families and teachers of an entire school grade to the school in the evening for a private event focused on families building learning literacies. Of these parents, 92% plan to use the activities presented at home with their children. 98% felt more confident in their abilities as a parent. 99% said their family would return to the museum to benefit further. 12,000 children and their families at 50 schools are served annually. Para Los Niños serves 7,000 each year with similar results, exclusively in Spanish. Based in libraries throughout Houston, the Parlos Niños Workshop Series is dedicated to helping Spanish-speaking parents engage their children in educational activities during family time. Using the CMH-developed Parlos Niños curricula, museum educators work with participating libraries to provide parents with resources, strategies, and activities that improve their family learning practices and their abilities to serve as their child's first teachers. Each of the 10 workshops includes a story reading modeling session and a series of learning activities for use at home that support literacy development related to the workshop's theme. And of course, year round, week after week, there are lines of people waiting to enter the Children's Museum of Houston. And often when they leave, children cry because they wish they could stay longer. The most common misinterpretation about the Children's Museum of Houston is that there's no learning happening here, that it's too pretty, too much fun, too bright and cheery. Like our programs, every one of our exhibits started with a complex set of specific learning objectives, not just tied to TEKS, but to thought leaders in the content fields and best practices in learning. And because we facilitate with knowledgeable, well-trained content specialists, we take out-of-classroom learning to a new level. A panel of expert advisors decided the designs and learning objectives for each one of our 13 exhibits. For instance, the planning for our John P. McGovern Tot Spot exhibit, which is our 4,000 square foot gallery devoted to children under 36 months, was guided by Dr. T. Barry Brazelton from Harvard, founder of Touchpoints, and Dr. Susan Landry, founder of the University of Texas Children's Learning Institute. Other advisors work with Dr. Brazelton and Dr. Landry over the course of three years to help us create an optimum learning experience for families and young babies. Museum educators use a specific matrix of learning objectives connected to grade level TEKS to evaluate whether or not Totspot is serving people as intended. Numerous changes are made to the exhibit on an annual basis to achieve rotating new experiences, and like the rest of the museum, programming is changed weekly to ensure there's always something new and worthwhile to do. These efforts are evaluated for learning outcome results. Rice University CBEN Group, the people who work with buckyballs and nanotechnology at Rice University and University of Houston's Material Science Department, encourage the development of the Holthouse Foundation Matter Factory. Baylor College of Medicine helped prototype, design, program, build, and evaluate Power Tower, where a healthy decision making is encouraged. The American Bankers Association and the Federal Reserve did the same for our Ketropolis exhibit to promote financial literacy and civic engagement. MIT provided resources for our David and Jean Wiley Foundation Invention Convention exhibit, and specific objectives are met there daily. The Children's Museum of Houston provides high-quality, accessible learning resources for all of Houston's families with young children. We reach a tremendous number of parents each year and have real impact in their parenting skills as their child's first teacher. Approximately 800,000 children and their families attend the museum annually, and they reflect the socioeconomic and ethnic diversity in Houston. 40% Latino, 27% Anglo, 26% African American, and the rest are largely Asian. 30% of those visiting receive free admission through a network of 640 social service agencies, which distribute unlimited free tickets to those most in need. Additionally, 38% receive significantly discounted admissions. According to weekly surveys conducted of our visitors, the majority rates their museum experience as being equal to or more valuable than their expectations.
The museum has been consistently rated as one of the top museums in the country by popularly published polls, such as Parents Magazine, and has been awarded more than 17 nationally competitive awards in the past 10 years from the National Science Foundation, National Institutes of Health, and the Institute of Museum and Library Services. All of our programming and exhibits are delivered in English and Spanish. We change programming each week on site and deliver 12 programs of literacy, math, science, and parenting to over 100 community locations and annually to another 150,000 people. The Children's Museum of Houston is highly collaborative. Many of the programs we provide to the most vulnerable populations in the community are delivered through our partners in after-school settings in shelters, faith-based locations, libraries, and small community-based organizations. Budget cutbacks can affect these smaller organizations first, destabilizing the investment the museum has made in training their staff and providing programming. The retraining of the staff becomes an extra cost burden for us, and in some cases, entire programs have shut down, making it difficult for us to find a community-based home for our efforts. Needless to say, the community relying on our partners for core services then becomes needier and more destabilized as well. The Children's Museum of Houston devotes over half of its budget delivering programs on site and in the community, helping parents to encourage their children to value learning. We spend more than 30% of our annual budget reaching low-income children in English as a second language homes. All of our exhibits and programs are to enable children birth through 12 years of age to be prepared to learn in school and throughout life. Our long-range plan calls for sustainable growth on a relatively flat budget, with new programs being developed and deployed only as funding becomes available. For most of the past decade, the National Science Foundation, the National Institute of Health, and the Institute of Museum and Library Services provided this new venture funding for us and for our collaborators. But according to our predictions, these sources will not be available in the future. More resources would enable us to move ahead more quickly with updating curricula and activity guides and publishing more to enable families to learn at home together. With additional funding, we would have broader reach in our after-school family programming. At around 150,000 families annually, we are currently serving the highest number possible with the status quo staff levels. We would develop more collaboration to ensure that our parenting programs and our after-school content and skills-based programs reach our audience with a required minimum exposure to ensure that the dosage is sufficient to maximize outcomes. We would increase the evaluation of our programs and exhibits. Although we have an in-house department and a volunteer committee of experts, longitudinal studies would be possible with more resources. And working with partners on non-traditional funding sources, we would seize new business ventures to build new income streams such as licensing. The Children's Museum of Houston has spread itself as much as possible to address community needs, operating one of the largest children's museums in the country on a balanced budget annually, and conducting 12 programs of outreach to the community through a network of more than 640 social service agencies serving those most in need. Rather than take on more, our long-range plan calls for us to focus more depth on those six priority areas that we believe will continue to drive challenges for Houston's families. Our Institute for Family Learning will continue to be the nexus for us to use the museum's physical space as a lab to develop and test programs and then to deploy them in sites around Houston to address the need for quality bilingual educational opportunities that build learning literacy in our socioeconomically diverse population. We stand ready to adapt our programming, especially the parenting programming, to deliver it as efficiently and effectively as possible, increasing the dosage that we deliver to parents over time and through relationships that we will build with them. This will involve more use of webcasting and helping parents use their smartphone technology to engage their children in meaningful inquiry-based learning and an offshoot of using the web more to share our programming will be digitizing our materials so they have broader access and can be made more usable for children on the autism spectrum.